All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 26th. This is the 11 a.m. section. This is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> first things first, here is the sign-in sheet. Please make sure you sign this for today. So a few, uh, a few things and updates. Uh, I put in the assignments this morning. Uh, in no particular order, I had a couple people ask me about this. We have four TAs for the fall, and if anybody is interested in the TA position for the fall, I did put up the uh, TA application there. Uh, general requirements, had to be a student, <coughs> so if you graduate, can't be a TA. Uh, you have to have office hours. I uh, have taken this class because that's the only way you can be a TA to this class. I don't take other TAs, and it pays $15 an hour. Uh, so that's the actual position, for 10 hours a week. Anyways, uh, that's there. Also, just as a reminder, Monday, the assignment replacement will be due. Okay? So <clears throat> at any point during the semester, there's now 13 individual homework assignments with the extra homework 13 I posted today plus the Bloomberg uh, certification. Uh, so <clears throat> if you did poorly on any one of those assignments and or you missed one of those assignments, you can fill out the assignment replacement paper, 500 word paper, okay? Anytime between now and Monday, you turn it in. Uh, what we'll do is you don't tell us which assignment to replace. The TAs, when they do the opt-outs, will replace one of your assignments and what they'll do Sorry, there's other important conversations here. Uh, what, what they'll do <coughs> is they'll look to see if you either missed an assignment, in which they'll give you credit as if you did the assignment, got full points, or they'll look for the biggest gap between your grade and the, uh, the potential points, and then that's what will be replaced. But again, if you had missed an assignment, it will be treated as if you did the assignment and it won't count against you towards the final exam. Uh, opt out. Okay. So again, anytime between now and Monday, you can do that assignment paper. Okay. In addition, I posted homework 13, which again is essentially an extra credit assignment, as was homework 12. It is worth two points. Okay. So again, what that really practically means is that, and this is where Elms uh, doesn't really work very well. Uh, but basically, right now, with those two points, there's 105 potential points available this semester, okay? And that'll be the final extra credit. The way that I give extra credit is I just make more points available, okay? So really, two, two opportunities for extra credit. One, do the assignment replacement. Two, do the homework 12 and 13, uh, which is, again, two points each. And so that'll be the final extra credit. So again, back to grading. <coughs> when you go into Elms, you go into grade, I know, TAs are scrambling to kind of catch up on some of the grades as well. But uh, when you go into your grades, you look at that far right, the total, uh, ELMS can mislead you because it's not a percentage of total. Okay? Your grade in this class is total points across all assignments. Okay? And that's what's going to be added up. So when we do final grading, when I do the final grades, I'm going to export it to Excel, the whole grade book, and I'll add up all the points across all your assignments. And those total points will then be applied to give you a letter grade. And then we apply the total points against standard letter grading. So that means that if you want to get an A in this class, 93 and above is an A. So that means 93 out of 105 points is an A. Okay? 90 points out of 105 points is an A minus. Right? So it's total points, including the 105, to get A letter grade. Everything is standard with the exception of A plus because there's 105 points. This, the uh, A plus will be higher. It'll probably be like 101, 102. Got to see where the distribution of the class is to get an A plus, right? But nonetheless, uh, the most important thing for you if you're an accounting or finance major is you need 70 points to pass the class, right? Because that's a C minus, right? So that's what you're going to be looking for with the assignment replacement and the extra credit. So the extra credit, which will be due on Monday, which I posted today, is basically a multiples assignment on Meta, Alphabet, and Apple. Okay, I decided to do some tech companies. And essentially, very similar to the one we're gonna go over today, which is homework 12, which is the pharmaceutical, this one will be on tech, okay? And so again, same idea. 
premium or discount for the three multiples explain in a 500 word paper individually, including your screenshots, uh, why <coughs> uh, Meta is trading at a premium or discount to Alphabet and Apple. Okay, so that'll be for Monday. That'll be due at 10 a.m. Again, we'll cover that in class on Monday. Also, just as a reminder of some things, so next Wednesday, a couple things are going to happen. Uh, where is it down here? So next Wednesday will be group case multiples. Okay. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday should be is the presentations. Uh -huh. Yeah, May third, May fifth. What is what's next Wednesday? Third. Next Wednesday is the third. Yeah, next Wednesday is the group case multiple presentation. Okay, so that'll be the final presentation, and for many of you, the last day that we will meet as a physical class. Okay, so again, all six teams will present in all sections next Wednesday, and essentially, <coughs> uh, that will be on, and I put this up yesterday, thanks to the vote of this class, Parker Hannafin. Okay, so by the way, the other three sections, thank you. I told them what you guys did in your vote. Okay, so nonetheless, uh, what you're going to do is if, remember your EIC. It's going to be Parker Hannafin against two peers in each of their three segments. Okay, so just as a reminder, if you go to Bloomberg and you go to PH U.S. Equity, you go to RV. The default we're using here. So the load is the BIX best fit algo. Over here in this drop down, if you remember we did the IC, we did three different segments, right? Parker Hannafin was in flow control, they were in aircraft and parts manufacturing, and they were in diversified industrials. So what you'll do is you'll come down here to flow control, you'll see this list appears, pick two. All right, I'm not telling you which two to pick, I'm giving you the option to pick two of the peers and then you'll compare Parker Hannafin against those two peers with the data. You're going to get screenshots for all. Okay, and you'll put that into your PowerPoint. Right? And then you'll do the same thing with aircraft and parts manufacturing. And the same thing with diversified industrials. <clears throat> Just to make your life easier, if you pick one and you're doing the multiples and it's like missing data or you're having trouble, pick another one. So I'm trying to make your life a little bit easier by allowing you to pick the two from each segment, but that's the point. You're going to be doing Parker Hannafin against six companies in those three segments with those screen, screenshots in 10 minutes. All right. So I'm just suggesting it's going to have to be a very tight presentation because you're also going to put some real world context in there about why they're trading at a premium or discount. So that'll be next Wednesday. So back to grading. So if uh, it is necessary to fill out a peer review, peer reviews for the valuation assignment are going to be due on Friday, and peer reviews for the multiples assignment are actually going to have to be due on Thursday of next week, on May 4th. Okay, And the Bloomberg Trading Challenge, part two, ends next Wednesday as well. Okay, So again, 5 o'clock. And today, I'll take screenshots of all four sections. Don't liquidate your portfolios, right? And remember that you can't go above 300000 of cash. That'd be very bad. You get disqualified, and you have to have at least 10 longs by that day. Okay? So then I'll just rank teams and then basically score you top team. Uh, assuming you're not disqualified, gets five points. Worst team gets one point. Everybody else somewhere in the middle. And uh, that'll be the second half of the Bloomberg Trading Challenge, which ends next Wednesday. Okay. And then again, on Thursday, if you need to do a peer review for the Bloomberg Trading Challenge, the optional peer review is due on next Thursday. Okay. Now, the reason why all of this is due on those days is, back to the calendar, what's going to happen is that between next Thursday, when all the assignments are essentially due, and the following Monday, which I believe is May 7th uh, or 8th, we will basically put all the grades in, apply the opt-out criteria, 
and then tell you whether or not you're opting out of the final exam. And the way that you'll know is down here where it says final exam opt out points, right? What we'll do is if you're opting out of the final exam in this assignment, we'll put up an announcement to go check, you'll see 10 points, okay? So if you get to see the announcement, you go into final exam opt out points, you see zero points, that means you have to take the final exam, okay? But if you see 10 opt out points there, you don't have to take the final exam. Those 10 points will be added to your grade. And at that point, you can go look at the total of, of all the points across your assignments. You'll know your letter grade, okay? And so that'll essentially be that Monday, May, was that 7th or 8th? Let's the calendar here. Try to do this from memory. May 8th, okay? Now, for those of you that have zero opt-out points on Monday, May 8th, you will take the final exam during class time that you're registered for on Wednesday, May 10th, okay? And essentially, you have 90 minutes to take the final exam unless you have an accommodation. And the final exam will be a 10-question multiple-choice exam. Okay? It is open book. It is open notes. It is on the theory of what we did this semester. All right? So it might be a question like, which of the following would improve your ROIC? An increase in inventory, a decrease in accounts payable, an increase in excess cash a decrease in other non-operating liabilities, none of the above, okay? Those are the types of questions you're gonna see on the final exam, okay? So again, <clears throat> I don't know how to tell you to study for it, because again, I'm not gonna ask you something we haven't talked about in class, but again, you know, so in terms of everything in the book is fair game in the context it was been talked about or at least mentioned in class, right? So I'm not gonna write an exam that basically does something we've never talked about, wouldn't make any sense, and it is in a sense cumulative, because all the content in this class built upon each other, okay? So that would be the final exam for those of you who have to take it. The reason why I'm making it a multiple choice exam is because later that day, after you take it, well, it'll immediately score, but then I'll publish the scores, and then, as I said, we'll put those in, and then you'll see your final grades. And the letter grades will probably be sent to uh, UMAG a couple days later. Right? I know you're also getting harassed uh, by the university to fill out a, a uh, review for this class. Please take the time to do that. Uh, appreciate any feedback you want to give uh, <clears throat> and uh, again just it's helpful uh, to see that feedback so please uh, take time to fill that out and any questions about this or any of the assignments or anything else you got to do hopefully pretty straightforward thank you all right so let's talk about homework 12 So you did a multiple analysis on Merck, AbbVie, and Lilly for homework 12. Okay. So again, <clears throat> we'll start out with the price to earnings multiple. So this is the, the data that I got. Your data might be slightly different depending on the day of the week that you did it, but nonetheless, it'll be a, at least approximate amount to this. Now, when you did this data based on Merck's multiples, let's start with that, it came up with a negative G. Right. And I know several of you went to the TA, several of you emailed me, you're like, is it possible to have a negative G? Kind of trying to give a hint with an announcement, but let's at least address this, okay? So remember that all of these multiples are basically based on the key value driver, which is treating the entire company like a perpetuity, all right? So I'm just doing a very, very long-term cash flow of the firm. That's what we're doing. We're simplifying the DCF to just this key value driver perpetuity equation, okay? And so essentially, when I put these variables, and three variables for PE have to make the most sense, all right, to drive that perpetuity, it's growth and spread, I have to make sure that that growth spread combination makes sense in perpetuity, okay? So the point is, typically, uh, for most firms, you're gonna see positive growth in a perpetuity, but not always. And, and the case for Merck is it's gonna have a little bit of a negative G. Now, Negative G could come in one of two ways. Uh, it could be your poor bed, bath, and beyond, and you were plummeting towards the ground. You tried to get your emergency bailout. You didn't get it, and now you're filing for bankruptcy and liquidating the entire company. So that, that's a negative G. If we were to do bed, bath, and beyond, it would make sense. That could be pretty big because it was basically forecasting that they were going out of business. Right? Now, in the case of Merck, this negative G doesn't mean Merck is going out of business. Right? This negative 1.76% G per year 
is another way of saying, and I'll keep it simple, but Merck is doing really well right now with a drug called Keytruda and another drug called Gardasil. And you can actually see it here if we go to their EEO. And if we look at EEO, sorry. and we look at the company specific tab where it actually for a pharmaceutical firm lists kind of forecast by drug. And you can see these top two drugs here, Keytruda, which that drug alone had t almost $21 billion of actual sales last year, right? It's now the best-selling drug in the world. It's about $100,000 a treatment, uh, cures cancer, immunotherapy, right? So very, very popular drug, especially, they literally save people's lives, right? But it's extraordinarily expensive. And as you can see, this drug, which is $21 billion of sales by 2026, that one drug alone is expected to be $31 billion worth of revenue, okay? And Gardasil uh, is another drug that's pretty popular. It's about $6.9 billion of sales by 2026, almost $11 billion of sales. And so by 2026, those two drugs are going to represent, rounding off, 31 plus 11 is $42 billion worth of sales for just those two drugs. I mean, there's many companies that don't have that many total sales. That's just two drugs. And those drugs are under patent protection, which means they're essentially monopolies, and Merck is making extraordinarily margins on those drugs. Remember, I can kind of see here, when you look at their profit forecast, 2026, 69 billion of revenue, and they're getting 34 billion of EBITDA, okay? So again, huge cash flow, huge profit, I mean, this is about as good as it gets for a company. You're like, well, how does this translate into a negative G? Okay. Well, one of the other companies we're going to look at today is a company called AbbVie. And AbbVie has a drug called Humira, which up until uh, Keytruda passed it, it's for, uh, I forgot what happened. Humira is uh, anti-inflammatory. Uh, it was the best-selling drug in the world until Keytruda passed it last year. But the point is, AbbVie, if I go back to forecast and their company specific for drug sales, Humira sales last year were $21 billion for just that one drug. This year, $13.8 billion. Next year, $8.8 billion. 2025, $6.6 .6 billion. 2026, $5 billion. Why is Humira sales going from $21 billion to $5 billion over the next few years? Yeah. They're coming off patent. Exactly. And so that's the problem, is that when a pharmaceutical company has a patent, they're a monopoly, they make extraordinary returns, when the patent expires, everyone go in there, right? The generics show up, the biosimilars show up, and prices plummet, and to some degree demand starts to go down, because now they have to split the pie with other people. They don't make nearly as much money, okay? So nothing lasts forever. That was actually one of the key things we talked about in the very first week of the class, building a sustainable long-term business. There's regression to the mean over time, and it's hard to maintain that competitive advantage, and that is essentially what happened to Abbey. Their patent, patent fortress is coming down, the competitors are here, and they're gonna lose 70% of their sales for their best-selling drug. 2028, Keytruda's patent expires. What do you think is gonna happen to Keytruda by 2032? They're gonna have 30 billion of sales? No, that drug with 30 billion of sales is gonna see its revenue plummet and its margins plummet, no different than Humira. That is what's going on with Merck's valuation, okay? As a matter of fact, it's, it was kind of funny. I actually transparently do work with Merck, and I was talking to them about this, and they're all excited about all their sales, and now it's the best-selling drug in the world. By the way, it happens to cure cancer, which they should be very proud of, don't get me wrong. And financially, they're making a, a, a killing. Financially, they're like, why isn't the market giving us credit for this? And I actually went into a Bloomberg terminal. I said, well, let's look at the analysts are saying in the BICO. Actually, let's go to Merck. Let's go look at what the analysts are saying in the BICO about Merck. And let's go with BICO. Here it is. And if you read through the BICO, read through the analyst reports, what the analysts are talking about is not how successful Katrina is going to be, but they're already fretting about the patent cliff. 
five years out, they're actually saying, oh my God, what are you gonna do when this, this drug, which is 40% of your sales, goes off patent? You don't have a replacement for that. And, and so that's the problem, is that they don't have a replacement for that. And it'd be hard to replace that drug, right? So those, those drugs of that size don't just walk around all the day, they can't just find them. And so that's the point. Merck is gonna actually experience a situation where longer term, when that patent expires, Katrina's gonna go up patent, they're gonna lose a lot of sales, and they don't have something that big to replace it. So I'm gonna translate. Their future's really good right now, but long term, it's not gonna be as good. So translation, negative G of 1%. Okay? That's essentially what the market is saying. The market is saying that this is the peak times. These are the good old days. Okay? The future actually doesn't look as good as today. And so therefore, your spread, your margins, your profits, your cash flows are actually going to start going down over time, not up over a long period of time. If I'm doing like a 30-year forecast for them, it's going to be much worse 30 years from now than it is today. I'm not saying they can't find something else, but right now the market doesn't see it, and that's why they have a negative G. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on. And so that's how you can justify a negative G. It's just the company right now is doing better than it is long term. Okay, it's kind of peaked. Right? As opposed to, it could also have a negative G because it's going away. That's possible too. Right? But <clears throat> it's probably going to be one of those two reasons if we're dealing with these big companies. Does that make sense? Questions, comments about that? All right, so in that context, let's go back and do our analysis of these multiples. So, all right. So, First thing we say is AbV is trading at a premium to Merck. Why? Right? Well, on a PE multiple, based on the data we had, first of all, AbV has a giant spread. Okay? AbV is expected ROE. I put it at 106%. It's extraordinarily high. Merck 34, okay? Against cost capital of about 6 and 7% respectively. Now, here's the thing is that when your spread gets, or sorry, when your ROE or ROIC gets really, really high, I think 30% plus, it doesn't make that much of an incremental difference. Okay? Here's the point. Put AbbVie's ROE 40%. Notice it barely budges that PE. Okay? So the first thing you should just understand about key value drivers is extreme ROEs, extreme ROICs, incrementally don't actually matter that much. Okay? Because the whole point is, at that point, what you're doing is with high returns means you're not really investing much. Okay? So whether you're investing a tiny bit or a little tiny less, it's not going to change your overall free cash flow that much. Okay? So that's the first thing. So both companies, all three companies on this list, have really high spreads. Okay? So yes, the higher spread at AbbVie, 106 versus 7 versus 34 minus 6, that makes a little bit of difference, right? But the real reason why Abby is trading at 15 times earnings and Merck is trading at 13.7 times earnings is because of the growth difference, right? Because Merck has a big spread, which is shrinking, 1.76% a year. Abby has a giant spread, which is growing a little bit, half a percent a year. But that's the major difference in their two multiples, okay? The other thing is that Abby has a higher cost of capital cost of equity is higher, 7% versus 6%, and that is muting, because like I said, put this at 5.9, they're multiple, because it'd be closer to 18, they have the same risk. So given Merck's lower risk, Merck is benefiting by the lower perceived cost of equity, and that is helping their PE multiple, but really Merck's low PE is just lack of growth. All right? And it's not growth over the next few years. It's going to be staggering over the next few years. It's just perpetuity. The perpetuity growth the market just doesn't see, and that's why they're trading at a discount. Okay? What's going on with Lilly? Lilly's got a really, really high premium over Merck. Why? Well, they also have a very high spread, 75% or so expected ROE against 7.6% cost of equity. But what Lilly has is growth. Right? they're expected to grow longer term, about 5%. And part of it, and you can go back to Lilly, because again, one nice thing about pharmaceutical firms is that 
if they have drugs, they have to go through the regulators and the regulators publish the data. So generally, pharmaceutical firms don't just pop out with a drug you've never heard of. They have to go through clinical trials. They have to go through stage four, stage three, clinical trials. That's all reported, and they have to get approval to be sold on the marketplace. So as you're going through clinical trials, your data is public, and basically the markets are looking at all that data. So that's the point. They have a pretty good idea of the pipelines of these pharmaceutical firms. And when you look at Lilly, and you look at the, the pipeline, you start looking at some of these drugs, Lilly's big drug that everybody is excited about is a drug called Manjaro. Okay. Has anybody heard of Manjaro before? You're going to hear about it. Has anybody heard of Ozempic before? Yeah. All right. Uh, Manjaro is the better version of Ozempic. Okay. So it's basically the same underlying drug as Ozempic, but it actually has something else that it does that Ozempic doesn't do. All right, because basically what Ozempic apparently does is it slows down people's metabolism, okay? And that's helping with weight loss. And people that are taking Ozempic for type 2 diabetes not only get lower blood sugars, but they can lose a lot of weight, okay? And so that's the point. People are taking weight loss drugs. Manjaro not only does that, it helps you burn fat. It does two things. And so very soon you're going to hear people talking about Manjaro like they're talking about Ozempic. But the point is weight loss drugs are expected to be $100 billion a year in sales coming up in the next five or six years because the insurance companies are scared as hell about this, right? Because they're going to start covering these drugs. Right now, they're not covering these drugs. And basically, when they start covering these drugs and people start taking them in mass, like, this is going to be a huge industry. Well, Lilly is at the forefront of what's the best chemistry with a patent-protected drug in that. And as that gets to be looking in the out years, this is potentially Katruda like numbers. And that's what the market is jazzed about. And that's the whole point of the growth. They got a couple of drugs, particularly for diabetes, particularly for weight loss, that are in the right place at the right time and are on a trajectory to grow very dramatically. So they're the early stages of this, right? Merck with Katruda is kind of like mid to late stages of Katruda, right? Manjaro and a couple of the other Lilly drugs are in the early stages. So when you look at all this, they have a higher growth trajectory, and that's being re represented in their G, which is growing at almost 5% a year. So if you wonder why Lilly's trading at a big premium and why Lilly has a big PE multiple, they have the highest risk, cost of equity at 7.6, well, it's not that high. But long story short, high spread, almost 5% per year growth. That's why they're trading at a premium. Questions? All right. Then you would have gone over here to your EV to EBIT. You would have found similar information. So again, Merck trading at a discount to both companies. Why is Merck trading at an EV to EBIT of 12.1 versus AbbVie's 13.99? Same reason. Even though Merck has slightly lower spread based on operating ROIC, and again, today looks like tomorrow, so I was using the operating RICs, the RVs, that basically at about a 35% operating RIC against a 6% WAC. The problem with Merck is that negative 1% operating growth as well. Okay, so they got a negative G there. That's basically holding down their multiple of EV to EBIT. They also have the highest tax rate amongst the three firms, 17.5%. So lack of growth, higher tax rate, even though they have the lowest risk at 5.7%, is why they're trading at a discount of 12.1 EV to EBIT, right? Why is Abby trading a little higher than Merck? Same reason, they have a slightly higher spread, 48% ROIC versus 6.6% WAC, slightly lower tax rate of 15 versus 17 and a half, but primarily they're growing at 0.6% a year and Merck is shrinking that big spread at 1% a year. That's why Abby is trading at a little bit of premium here, same reason as the PE. And why does Lilly have the biggest EV to EBIT? Same reason as the PE, right? They have a very high operating spread. It's actually very similar to Abby's, slightly higher wax, a slightly lower overall spread, but it's that 4.8% growth, right? And slightly lower tax rate, but it's the growth, right? And so high growth, high spread, high multiple, just straight 101 key value drivers. So this one should have been straightforward, very similar to the PE. And then the final one is EV to sales. 
Okay. So the question is, why does Merck have the lowest EV to sales? Well, it's interesting. Their operating margin, based on their trading multiples, suggests it's going to be higher than Lilly's, 42 versus 34. Okay. So why are people paying more for Lilly's sales if Merck actually makes more on their sales? And the answer goes back to the productivity. Merck is spending a dollar of capital to drive a dollar of sales, and Lilly's spending 68 cents to drive a dollar of sales. Right? And so when you put the two together, essentially Lilly turns into a higher ROIC out of those sales, and that is why they're trading at a little bit higher EV to sales than Merck. That's why Lilly's trading at a premium there. They're trading at 1039, Merck is 508. Why is Abby trading at a premium to Merck? Well, Productivity to Abby is a little worse. They're 83 cents to the dollar, still a little bit better than Merck, but they also have the highest operating margin at 47%, highest after tax margin. That's why Abby's trading at a premium to Merck. Okay? But again, if you kind of think it through, it makes sense of why these numbers are what they are, at least directionally. All right, so this hopefully was not too difficult assignment, with the one exception that the negative G probably threw a few people off, seeing that for the first time. But any questions about homework 12? And so when you do Parker Hannafin next week, this is what I mean. I know you got 10 minutes. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, and it took a longer, longer 10 minutes to go through this assignment. But that's the point. You notice how I was linking to what's going on with Abby and a couple of their drugs, what's going on with Merck, a couple of their drugs. Like you guys did an EIC on Parker Hannafin. You already talked about these three segments. Pull that data in to give you some context on why you're seeing the multiples, what you're seeing. Okay? So that's what you're going to be to do next Wednesday. All right, let's talk about a, a couple of other examples and or challenges that you might have, okay? So one is, <clears throat> while I was sitting here this morning uh, getting ready to talk to you guys right before 11, I went to the top headlines and just scan the headlines, trying to do this every day, see what's going on. <clears throat> I'm doing the Bloomer Train Challenge. This also could help me find some potential opportunities. But uh, let's see if it's been pushed from the headlines. Probably. Maybe featured stories. All right, it's gone from the headlines now after about 35 minutes. But there was a headline today about Tesla. Company news. Let's see if I can find it there. There we go. This was the story. Tesla bets the house on low prices, razor thin margins. So before I click on the story, t somebody tell me what's going on. What's going on with Tesla that's caused their stock price to go down another $5 today? They're down 50% over the last six to nine months. All right, the market's freaking out because they're under 500 billion in market cap, all right, versus they were almost a trillion in market cap not too long ago. Like what's going on with Tesla? And their earnings call did not excite anybody. They had a terrible earnings call. Yeah. They've been reducing the price of the cars. Why? Why are they reducing the prices of the cars? What's the goal? What's Musk been saying? Yeah. All right, he's, he thinks it will help stimulate demand, but he's other reasons he's talked about it. Why else are these reducing the price of the cars? Exactly. And, and these, these car companies <clears throat> are starting to erode their share and eat into his sales, and he doesn't like that. And he wants to be dominant in the market, so he, he's more concerned with revenue than profits. And that's what he said. He's like, I don't care about making profits on my cars. I want to sell more cars. All right? And I want to be competitive against these upstarts that are finally here. Well, that isn't what the market wanted to hear, because <laughs> the market was expecting them to make a lot on their cars. And what he's been doing, he's been slashing the prices of his cars. And the problem is, and this is what the article is referring to, and this is Bernstein, one of the analysts, was basically saying, demand doesn't seem to be as elastic as Elon Musk thinks. So the problem is he's been slicing, slicing off the price of his cars, but he's not actually selling more cars. And that's what the market is starting to freak out about. Now, it's just a very early in the game play, but the idea that you cut the price by $5,000 and people buy a whole lot more cars, that's not playing out today. 
Okay, so he's cutting down the price of five thousand dollars, and people are buying slightly more cars, but not enough to, to drive the volume to justify on a break-even basis the price cuts. And so that's the point. That's why the 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 margins are going down. And so what's happening, and you can see this on the EEO. If you look at the EEO for the next four years, do you see all those red arrow downs? What do you think a red arrow down means again? What's a red arrow down on the EEO screen tell you? Where does that come from? I'm going to hover over this box. <clears throat> what a red arrow down means is that the average number, because the way that these consensus estimates, as a reminder, are done is the sell side analysts, which are uploading their spreadsheets to Bloomberg, are being aggregated, and that's what's creating these guesses. It's just the average guess of the sell siders. And so what it's saying is that in the last 30 days, the average guess has been going down, okay, versus where it was. As a matter of fact, if you hover over this, you can see that in the last 30 days, these changes, the consensus the past four weeks, negative 12.26%. Okay, so for EPS in 2023, which is now $3.50, it was 12.5% higher a month ago. So the red arrow down is flagging to you that the analysts have essentially been lowering their estimates, right? But it's interesting if you look at Tesla's forecast for the next four years, they're not just lowering the profit estimates, they're lowering the estimates of the entire company. Okay, so that's the point. Less profit, less revenue, less cash flow, less return on equity, less return on investment, less EBITDA margin, all versus where they were a month ago, cut. So as he's cutting prices, they're not assuming that he's actually getting more volume to make up for this. They're assuming it's just going to be a brawl, right? And again, in the strategy world, they talk about red ocean, blue ocean. You guys familiar with those terms? Is that red ocean? What's a red ocean? What's a blue ocean? Let's talk about in some of your other classes. What's red ocean, blue ocean? It's a couple of people nodding their heads here. What's what's red or blue? I saw you nodding your head. That's the blue ocean. So yeah, and what's the red ocean? Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, my version of red ocean, blue ocean is, red ocean is, you're out there trying to, to fish. It's a blood in the water everywhere. There's sharks and piranhas around. It's going to be hard to fish. Okay? That's the red ocean. It's just lots of competition, hard to make money. Just, a, just It's really a pressure-filled market. Blue ocean, you're Forrest Gump after the hurricane. Right? You're the only shrimp and boat out there. You're catching all the shrimp. It's really easy to fish when nobody else is around. Okay? And that's the point. Like... Tesla, when they first started, was, were kind of blue ocean. They were the only EV game in town. And, and they could pretty much sell the cars at whatever price they did, within reason. And you didn't have a choice. If you wanted an electric car, you bought a Tesla. The uh, game has now changed. And there's a lot of competitors from serious automakers that are coming that are actually pretty good cars. And that's the problem. What Musk is now realizing is that Teslas don't stack up so well against them. And so in order to, to drive volume, he's cutting price. And that is affecting the financial modeling that the analysts had assumed because they assumed he would maintain that competitive advantage. They, may, they assumed Tesla, people would pay the price premiums for the brands. They're just not doing that and not the volumes that they did. So less cash flow. Well, guess what? Less cash flow, lower price. Okay. So let's put this in the context of our multiple analysis. Okay. So let's explain Tesla's 2024 multiples. Okay, so what if we were to go to our model? Let's call this a. Uh, this today today is April 26th, and I'm going to play replace Merck with Tesla. What's going on with their multiples? Okay. So in terms of the net income, if we do second forward year, is that 17.304? So pretty good. Re 
return on equity for Tesla? 22 to 24%. So I'm just going to call it, we'll give them credit, 20, 23. Right now their PE, second forward year is 31.2. That's about Lily's. And their cost of equity, 12.8%. A lot of uncertainty with Tesla. That's still a very high G. All right. So the market's still expecting a lot of growth, <clears throat> but that's the point. When you get to that level of growth, there's the 12.5% price cut. I get the growth, but I have slightly lower returns. 30% ROE versus 23% ROE, that knocks out about that 12% or so, 12, 20% of value, however it is, last few months. But that's the point. Growth at a slightly lower return, lower spread, growth at a lower spread, not worth as much. This, when we talked about the four scenarios of the key value drivers, this is that third scenario. We basically said high spread companies that see slowing growth <laughs> basically see their multiples come down, okay? So in this case, what he's seeing is lower growth of the earnings as opposed to sales. So that translates to maintaining the growth at the expense of return is the same thing. It's the maturing companies. We would expect the multiples to come down. He's having more competition. The ocean's getting a little redder. <coughs> and Tesla is now going to have to compete for share, not just go get it all by themselves. In order to protect that, they're not going to be as valuable. One could argue that this should have been expected. Like this two or three years ago shouldn't be a surprise. Every one of those automobile companies from Mercedes to BMW to Ford to GM was basically saying we're going after that market, right? And, and you, you can't expect that, that they weren't going to produce decent cars, right? And that's the point. Now that they're actually being sold, the market's all freaking out about this because Tesla's having to finally respond. But as I said, this should not have been a surprise. So in a way, you could argue that Tesla's probably overvalued a couple of years ago. People were too optimistic on how long these things were going to last before they started coming down a little bit. So, but anyways, so just a little, this is a regression of the mean to more realistic long-term forecast. I don't think Tesla's going to double in value again anytime soon. All right. So that was Tesla. To come, what's going on today? Uh, I want to talk about, and this is a, a variation of your assignment because I almost put this company on the list today. Like I had actually typed in Meta, Alphabet, and Snap. And I looked at the data, and I was like, this one's gonna be hard. And so, you're welcome. I switched it to Apple, All right? But I should have left Snap, All right? So, let's look at Snap. Do you use Snap anymore? Is it still a thing? I'm just what the, the younger generation uses. Have you moved on? Is it now just all TikTok? Is anybody really doing that you do Snap? Snapchat. Snapchat. You still use it? Like a lot? Or is it just you have it? Do I? Maybe I can see, but I use it. You don't really use it? I'm just wondering, because I know a few years ago it was like the it thing, and now I don't think it's the it thing anymore. Anyways, <clears throat> so let's look at Snap, and, and let's tell you what. I'm going to give you, open your Bloomberg terminals. I'll give you about five to seven minutes. Just do the multiples of Snap. See if you can come up with a reasonable multiple analysis Snap against uh, Meta. In fact, that's how you can start your homework because Meta is one of your assignments. Do Meta, do Snap. Well, let's talk about the two companies real quick. Okay. Meta against Snap.
So you guys as 11 a.m. section who showed up, get a little head start over everybody else, because that's the same meta as your homework that you In fact, even before you leave today, you might want to take the ones for Alphabet and Apple, take some screenshots, and then come back to the lab. But for right now, that's